So in 2015, um, this picture of dress became viral all over the internet because people quickly realized that, you know, what they see may be totally different from what others see. So I still, you know, vividly remember the day when I first saw this picture from the Facebook feed asking the color of the dress. I was wondering, you know, what is so special about this picture? Because it is white and gold to me without a hesitation or doubt. So I was like, you know, scratching my head and then um, I started to read the replies, the responses below the picture. And there are some crazy people saying, well, I see the dress as black and blue. What? No chance. I was talking to myself. And is this some kind of an April Fool's joke? But it was still a month away. Um, I believe the picture was actually posted um, around like end of April, uh, end of February at the time. <clears throat> so I just couldn't really understand what's really going on. So um, I asked other members of my family. You know, I couldn't believe what I had to hear. So they all see the dress blue and black. And now I became the one who's gone crazy. So since then, um, it has been actually reported that about 60% of the people see the dress as blue and black, 30% as white and gold, like me, and 10% blue and brown, and about 10% of people can switch between any of the color combinations. So it is, you know, quite striking and shocking to experience how segregating our perception can be. So this phenomenon has been subject to ongoing research why people see so differently, even though there's a still no consensus or hands down explanation why this is the case. So um, in the same year, a group of researchers uh, hypothesized that you know there may be a difference in brain activity between the people seeing different color combination uh, in parts of their brains, um, which is thought to be responsible for higher cognitive functions in color perception. So the researchers um, decided to recruit 28 subjects and compare their relative brain activities in various parts of the brain with um, functional magnetic resonance imaging from people um, you know, who perceive the dress as white and gold uh, on the right here, right? So, so they'll be just, you know, given the picture of the dress. And then this group of people, the WG group, will see the dress as white and gold. And the BB group uh, will see the dress as uh, blue and black. So this is a typical example of comparing two group situation where two groups are compared over a single shared outcome measure, outcome variable, which is uh, brain activity measured by fMRI. So in this case, the people in WG group only see uh, the dress as white and gold, and the people in BB group will only see the dress as blue and black. So the groups are mutually exclusive. So the comparison of brain activities will be between subject, right? Because they are not related. So now let's play the uh, game of NHST uh, with this study. So um, we need to set up the uh, null and alternative hypothesis first, right? So. So we know that the um, our outcome variable is brain activity, right? And the grouping variable. So this is, um, uh, you know, typical, um, you know, scenario where you want to use t-test, right? So, um, you know, one we we know the outcome variable and the grouping variable um, is basically the um, the color of the dress or the perception of the uh, color of the dress, right? So that is the grouping variable um you know so we we um split the uh, the subject group based on their perception 
of your color of the dress. So now just let's say that X bar is representing the overall brain activity, right? So we have overall brain activity of BB group. And in setting up the null, we will assume that their overall brain activity will be same or there will be no statistical difference between these two groups, right? So that is how we uh, usually set up the yet null hypothesis, right? You assume no difference, no change, uh, no relationship whatsoever. So in this case, we do not assume any difference between the two groups in terms of the brain, the overall brain activity. Now, how about the alternative hypothesis? Um, because we don't know which way the group will differ, and it is actually safe to set it as two-tailed hypothesis instead of uh, one-tailed hypothesis, right? So you will say that overall brain activity of B, B group will just differ from the overall brain activity of the WG group. And the decision rule is um, the nominal alpha 0.05, right? So if the p-value uh, after running the t-test uh, turned out to be less than alpha 0.05, then what do we do? We reject the null of no difference, right? So that means uh, that there is a significant difference between the two groups in terms of their overall brain activity. Now, the good thing about the two-tailed test is that you can figure out the direction of the difference later on by looking at the actual um, the difference or the sign of the difference. Okay, so in a sense, you really do not have to predict uh, the direction of the difference beforehand because the t test will tell you um you know where the um, where, where where the difference is basically right? you can see that which groups uh, mean will be um higher or be smaller than the other so that way you can actually figure out you can make your uh, conclusion about the direction of uh, the result um, by just uh, looking at at the result right So um, now they have their research question set up and, you know, we know our decision rule. So they measured um, the subject's brain activities using fMRI as uh, shown here uh, in this picture. So this is a frontal view of fMRI, right? Okay. And the subject will just lie down like this and they're going to be just... Um, um, move into the bore. So this is the uh, what is called the bore of the fMRI. And you know what this uh, you know this device around the uh, the subject head is um, head coil. So that device is actually used to amplify the brain signal of the patient. And what this um, subject is holding is the um, kind of an input device, right? So. Here, this is like a kind of a periscope. So there's a mirror um, which reflects the um, uh, whatever visual signal that is fit into this fMRI machine. There's a separate you know, control room um, to present some kind of experimental visual stimuli. So this subject actually can see um, those visual stimuli um, through this mirror off of... Um, so that is basically the reflection off of a mirror, like a periscope. And so what they did is actually, the, you know, um, send the um, this picture of uh, the dress, right? And then um, the subject is just looking at the picture and just, you know, thinking about the color. So just thinking about the color they see from this dress. And then in real time, uh, while they're doing that, the brain activity, uh, uh, brain activity of this patient is being recorded. And so basically you record the, the brain activity of all 28 subjects, right? Uh, regardless of the BB group or the WG. So these are the data, the overall brain activity 
from the BB group. So the BB column represents the brand activity of the BB group and the double G column. Um, the values represent the average overall, uh, the brain activity of the WG group. And even from this raw data, uh, we can see that there's something going on between these two groups, right? So if you look at the signs of these values, you know, the BB groups, the BB groups have all negative signs except for a couple of these data. On the other hand, the WG group, these values are all positive. Uh, except for these two um, negative um, brainwave activity. So, I mean, we can, we can see that already uh, that there's something going on between these two groups, right? When they see the same dress. So let's just, uh, uh, you know, uh, move this data into Jamovi to run some exploratory data analysis and the t-test. Okay, here is um, the brainwave data, straight copy from the um, slide. Um, so when these two groups are independent groups to be compared, then you actually need to rearrange this data set so that you can run independent samples t-test. So what you need to do is to cut this data set uh, by control, hold, hold down control X and then control V. So you put all the outcome measure in one column, okay? And then you're going to name it as rain wave. And you use another column to distinguish um, the group membership. So you just assign any arbitrary number. The first 14 and assign different number for the other group. So um, this is how you enter the data for the um, independent groups to be compared. So this second column should be, say, a group where one represents TV group, and two represents WG group. Okay. So now we are ready to run independent samples t-test and respective descriptive analysis so basically exploratory data analysis so in fact all these t tests comes with basic um, descriptive data analysis so we can just use um, independent samples t test instead of running this exploration <coughs> so here we are now we'll just take min difference and it's confidence interval. We need descriptives. We also need descriptive plots and the uh, hypothesis. You know, by default, we will just uh, choose two tailed hypothesis. And for independent samples t test, you need to check two assumptions, right? One is homogeneity test, and the other one is a normality test. So homogeneity of variances. So if the variance of the brain wave between the two groups are, you know, more or less equal, statistically speaking, and also the normality is checking if the data from the BB group is normally distributed and also um, the WG group data also normally distributed. By the way, I think there's a mistake. Um, so the first 14 should be BB group. Right, and then the remaining 14 is WG. Ooh. Collect analysis. Right, so I think we're ready. So we have you know, students, so that is the default t-test, parametric t-test. But in case the homogeneity of variance 
um, test turned out to be significant. So that means homogeneity of variance assumption is not met, then you need to check this Welch's T test instead of a student's T, right? Um, in case the normality of any group is violated, then you will need to run Man and Whitney U test instead of a student's T, okay? Um, so that is basically the, um, so the Man and Whitney U is a non-parametric alternative to student's T test, whereas Welch's T test is um, another parametric test in case the homogeneity uh, variance assumption is violated. Uh, we will talk about this uh, in more detail later on, but um, I think that is it. Um, so we move brainwave, which is our dependent variable or outcome measure to the dependent variable. And now you have to move the grouping variable to the grouping variable. All right, so here is the result. So first, you always have to look at the descriptive statistics, or at least you need to report the descriptive statistics first before you look at the um, independent samples t-test result. So let's take a look at the group descriptives. So the outcome measure is brainwave, and we have two groups, uh, BB group and WG group, and each group uh, contains same number of subject. And <clears throat> the mean brain wave for the BB group is negative 0.27, whereas the mean brain wave activity for WG group is 0.31, uh, rounded from the three decimal points. So it looks like uh, you know there is different difference, but uh, we don't know. And if you look at the uh, standard deviation of each group, uh, it looks uh, pretty much the same, right? So there's uh, not much difference between the two. So this is, you know, sort of um, indirectly indicating that the homogeneity of variance, right, equality of variance between the two groups will be statistically not significant, meaning that the variances between these two groups will be more or less the same. And if we look at the side-by-side um, 95% -side confidence interval, um, you know, the WG group is high up here compared to BB, and it looks like this difference between the mean um, looks quite significant, actually, because there's really no overlap between these two error bars. And we will talk about this in more detail um, later on, you know, how we can actually, you know, eyeball if this difference will be statistically significant or not by looking at how much overlap there is between two um, error bars um, and error bars made by the 95% confidence interval. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, you know, different ways to um, represent errors in the data. So one of them is to use a standard deviation instead of a 95% confidence interval, or sometimes people use a standard error of the mean to show how much error there is, but they um, serve different purposes. Um, but, you know, this way of judging the statistical significance between the two groups is only possible when these error bars are made with 95% confidence interval. Okay, so um, that is our expectations and observations. Let's take a look at the normality test with the Shapiro-Wilk test. So Shapiro-Wilk test is um, checking if the data from BB group and WG group are more or less normally distributed. So this is a statistics from the Shapiro-Wilk test, and this is the probability p-value, uh, how likely it is to observe this statistics or more extreme. And 
So the probability is very high compared to the usual alpha 0.05. That means we fail to reject the null of no difference. But in this case, we are the difference is not the difference between BB group and WG group, but this is the difference between these data from normal distribution. So how close these data are to the idealized normal distribution. That's what it's testing. So this is not actual t-test, right? It is only checking the assumption before we run uh, the t-test. So as this is uh, larger than 0.05, that means uh, there is no difference, right? Uh, so, but the question is difference in what? So difference in normality, that's basically what it is telling you. So there's no statistically significant difference um, between the idealized normal distribution and the shape of the actual data. So what that means is that normality assumption is met for these data. And now that the normality assumption is met, so you always have to look at the normality assumption first. Because if it is violated, then you don't even have to look at this assumption. Right? If the normality is violated, then you need to run Man and Whitney U test without having to look at this assumption. But because this is satisfied, now let's look at the homogeneity of variance test, which is known as Levine's test. Right? So that statistics is called F-test, which is ANOVA, um, and it has two degrees of freedom. And, and the p-value, to observe this statistics or more extreme, is at 0 0.62787. Now, again, this is a, you know, greater than alpha 0.05, so we fail to reject the null of no difference. So in other words, um, it is more or less equal. The variances. Right? Again, this is not the T test. This is another assumption test to see if the variance between BB group and WG group in their brain wave activity are more or less equal. Okay? So, what that means is that the homogeneous variance assumption is met again for the data. So, both assumptions are met. Okay? And when you report the result from these assumption tests, you just basically um, you know, uh, state that what assumption you're testing and the name of the test, and just report the p-value and state if the assumption is met or not based on this p-value. Okay? Um, so I would say, well, for example, for a normality test, I would say, okay, so the normality assumption is uh, tested with Shapiro work test. Um, and I will just uh, open round bracket and report P equals such and such um, and saying that is met. So the normality assumption with the Shapiro work test is met and you report the P value. Okay, so that's how the assumption result is typically reported. Now we can take a look at the independent samples t-test result. So we are testing if there's any statistical difference in brainwave activity between these two BB and WG groups. So the test used was students t-test with this much statistics. So negative 5.83, um, that's T um, with the degrees of freedom of 26 equals negative 5.8361. So because we have negative statistics, what that means is that BB group, so the first group um, minus second group. So that's always uh, how the subtraction is done, right? First minus second. And that means, and then we have negative statistic means that BB group has smaller value than the WG group, right? So 
Um, the mean difference is again the negative, right? And so the sign should be the same between the statistics, I mean, the t statistics and the mean difference. And the p value is quite small, um, it's less than, much less than of a 0.05. So that means the difference, this mean difference is statistically significant, meaning that the brainwave, brainwave activity is actually statistically different between the BB group and WG group. Um, so when you report um, the T statistics, you have to say T. Um, well, I cannot really uh, write this on this screen, but I'll, I'll show you how to report the T statistics in a tutorial. Okay. We have to report the type of test statistics you used, T, um, and in the bracket, degrees of freedom, 26. And this is 26 because we have 28 data, right? The total number of data is 28 minus 2. And so that's how you get 26. So T, 26 equals negative 5.3. Uh, comma p equals this uh, with the mean difference and the 95% confidence interval. In this case, you know, the uh, both boundaries of 95% confidence interval is actually both negative. So this mean difference is statistically less than zero, right? Um, so that's what it means. Now let's take a look at um, you know, how we can quickly judge if this main difference will be statistically significant or not by looking at how much overlap there is between the two error bars. By the way, it was significant, right? And so your observation should be also consistent with this result too, okay? So let's just take a look at how we do that. Now we're back to the slide and this side by side 95% confidence interval is, uh, is, is a very useful visualization, especially when your goal is to compare between the groups, right? But uh, it is very useful because you can quickly figure out if the difference between the two groups uh, in terms of the mean difference uh, will be statistically significant or not without looking at the actual T statistics and P value. So this is how you actually quickly figure out um, if the mean difference will be statistically significant or not. So here we have um, uh, two 95% um, confidence interval placed side by side. So the you know middle dot represents the mean um, of each group, and these um, the lines represents the side of the uh, size of the 95% confidence interval. So in this case, um, there is, you know, basically no mean difference because the 95% confidence interval are overlapping, complete overlap between the two 95% uh, confidence interval, right? So in that case, we know that there is no difference, at least no statistically significant difference between the two groups. So N, S represents non-significance. Right? So we know that this um, group is not statistically different by just looking at how much overlap there is. And next one. Um, now, these mean uh, now looks different, right? But uh, the question is, if this, if these mean uh, is, uh, these means are statistically different, right? But if you look at the tip, the top of the um, this blue one, um, it actually covers the mean of the red one, right? And the, the bottom 95% uh, confidence interval actually covers the mean of the blue one. So when there's this much overlap, right? So uh, one of the tip covers the mean of the other group, then you know that this difference is not statistically significant either, okay? <clears throat> It is only when there is no overlap. Now, if you look at this, see the mean difference is quite large, 
right? And also, you know, the the top upper limit, upper limit of the red one is touching the bottom limit, the, the lower limit of the blue one. And they are quite, you know, separated, right? So in this case, we know that this mean difference will be statistically significant at about a p equals 0.01, okay? And if you have ooh, more separation, right? So there's uh, absolutely no overlap between the two confidence intervals, right? So then we know that this mean difference will be statistically significant uh, at the level of less than 0.01, right? So in these two cases, we expect to see the p-value um, greater than 0.05, but you know when there is basically no overlap, um, we know that the, the differences between the two groups will be statistically significant. So as a rough guideline, when there is no overlap between the two 95% confidence intervals, then the mean difference uh, will be statistically significant um, when the level of significance alpha is the nominal 0.05. So th these are those cases. If there is no overlap between the two um, in terms of the 95% confidence interval. But when there is an enough overlap, then the mean difference will not be statistically significant at the same level of significance alpha 0.05. For anything in between, right? For anything in between, you need to check the actual statistics to find out if the mean difference will be statistically significant or not. So side by side, 95% confidence interval is um, kind of a convenient way to quickly, um, you know, figure out if the groups are statistically different or not. But that only uh, is applicable when the error bars are created using the 95% confidence interval. As you can see from this graph, there are three different ways to create create an error bar. So basically what you see here is the, actually the same data, you know, which has mean of six, right? But um, these error bar are created using different dispersion statistics. So this one with standard deviation, this one with the standard error of the mean, and this is a you know ninety five percent confidence interval. So as you can see, they um, you know come with a different sizes you know depending upon uh, the kind of dispersion statistics you choose to use to create an error bar. And it is uh, you know uh, in general it is the case that the standard deviation comes with the largest error bar, and the standard error of the mean is. Uh, giving you the smallest size of error bar. So, um, you know, if you, if you read these journals, you know, people actually prefers, uh, prefer to use the, um, the standard error of the mean instead, instead of standard deviation or the confidence interval because it kind of gives you a kind of illusion that uh, of the clean data. You know what I mean? Because when you have these large vertical bars, um, especially when you have a lot of groups to compare, then that actually, you know, makes your data look kind of a dirty in a sense, right? Um, so people prefers the standard of the mean um, over other dispersion statistics. Um, it's okay as long as you um, you are explicit about you know what you use to create. Uh, the error bar, but when the goal of your experiment is to compare, so that the aim of the study is that it's a comparison between the groups, then you know uh, you have to use the 95% confidence interval because that facilitates the visual comparison between the means. So you can only do that in you know, a quick eyeball inference when the error bar is created using the 95% confidence interval, right?